Okay, everyone. So nice to see you all again. And so let's get down to some Dhamma business. And as always, we will start with uh, the most important thing, which is meditation practice. So we start to get some meditation done, get the important things out of the way. <laughs> and then we can discuss meditation afterwards. Uh, so uh, let's get started. So uh, as always, find yourself a nice, comfortable position. And just always start at the beginning just to uh, get that feeling for the body being just right, feeling the body, feeling the mind, but especially feeling the body as you start out uh, to make sure you are at ease, that you are relaxed, uh, so you can enjoy the next uh, half an hour or whatever it is. Uh, because if you can't enjoy it, you can't really meditate. Meditation is about enjoyment, uh, enjoyment of the present uh, enjoyment of the good qualities of the mind. And uh, just allow everything to be. Uh, don't think that you are meditating. Uh, don't think that you are doing anything in particular. Uh, think of yourself more as just resting. Uh, resting peacefully. Uh, resting with awareness. Uh, and as you rest in the right way, you can actually be at ease. Uh, if you think that you are doing something, uh, if you're thinking that you are making the process of meditation happen, uh, and usually you get in the way. The process of meditation is a natural process. It is a dhammata, says the Buddha. Dhammata means it happens in accordance with nature. And if you try to make nature happen, you do the exact opposite. You damage, you hinder the natural process from happening.
and just allow things to happen uh, according to their own causes and effects. Uh, don't try to force the meditation. Uh, the most difficult thing in meditation is just to be able to wait, uh, to be able to be patient, uh, to allow things to be. Uh, if you're just able to wait in the present uh, with a degree of mindfulness, uh, then the mind just gradually calms down all by itself. Uh, it is not you doing it. Uh, it is nature happening uh, on its own, uh, all by itself. Uh, and so just stand back, uh, allow things to happen in the right way. Uh, don't try to force things. Uh, be as patient as you possibly can. Uh. Meditation is founded on the principles of letting go and of enjoying. Yeah. And the letting go in a large part just means that you are aware without interfering. Yeah. It's like the old simile of being a passenger on the train. Yeah. 
you're just observing yeah you're not involved in the direction of the train or where it is going yeah? and when you come to the breath as your mind calms down yeah? in the same way you are a passenger yeah? seeing the breath through the window yeah? you're not in control of the breath yeah? the breath is like a distant object yeah? something you are observing without involvement yeah? this is the idea of mindfulness yeah? observing without involvement yeah? And when you do that, you find the breath starts to become delightful. Uh, it is the controlling of the world that is painful. Uh, and once that control disappears, uh, delight tends to take its place. Uh, and that is the second principle of meditation arising all by itself. Uh,
And uh, as you go along, uh, make sure that you note the pleasure of meditation, uh, the positive aspects of meditation, uh, because this will be a fuel for your meditation a long time into the future. Uh, feel that beautiful sense of shutting out the world, uh, much less sensory impact than you normally have, uh, and how delightful it is to leave that world behind. Uh, it is so busy, uh, it is so much activity, uh, so much doing, uh, that it is impossible to feel really peaceful in that world. Uh, also, if you can, notice the beautiful absence of all the uh, problems of the world, uh, all the issues that you normally think of. Uh, now is the time to put all of those things aside uh, and feel the beauty, if you can, uh, of that sense of emptiness inside. Uh, when you don't really attend to anything in the world, uh, all you do is enjoy the present right here, right now. Uh, and then lastly, uh, also enjoy the idea of not doing anything. Uh, seeing that doing is such a, a waste of, or a drain on the energy. Uh, it's such a, a painful thing in many ways. Uh, and when you don't do, uh, and you just be instead, uh, Actually, it's a much more pleasant abiding here. Yeah.
Okay, everyone. So just uh, just before we come to the end, uh, just spend a minute, uh, just review the meditation. Uh, and if you do feel a bit more peaceful and calm and relaxed and at ease uh, or whatever, uh, always ask yourself why that is the case. Uh, what have you let go of? Uh, how does the letting go happen? Uh, what are the perceptions that you have used? Uh, how do they come about? Uh, and as you investigate these things, uh, you start to understand how this works. Uh, Okay, 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 everyone. <laughs> so uh, that's it. So now we have <laughs> that's the meditation out of the way, so to speak, not really out of the way, because uh, I think that's what a uh, large part of the reason why we are here, but at least uh, uh, have done uh, uh, that which is most important, I think. Yeah. So I'm going to uh, now come on to a Dhamma talk. I'm going to talk just a little bit about. Uh, uh, as usual, some aspects of the Dhamma. I think last time we were together, I spoke a bit about uh, the practice of metta, and I'm going to continue a little bit on that, I thought. Uh, uh, I'm going to broaden it out to talk about all the four Brahma Viharas uh, and how they come about, what they are, uh, and uh, etc. Et because all of these Brahma Viharas are very beautiful things. Uh, and it's very useful for us to use them at different times and in different ways uh, uh, to enhance our spiritual practice. Uh, but one of the things that we've been talking about here recently uh, is how does the path actually come about? Uh, yeah, how does any aspect uh, of the practice come about? Uh, what is it that makes you more moral? Uh, what is it that makes you more peaceful as a person? Uh, what are, how does the whole Eightfold Path really happen? Uh, and uh, there, it's kind of very interesting because you can look at the idea of the path in different ways. Uh, you can look at the path from the perspective of, I am practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, I am practicing these things. Uh, and when you think of it like that, uh, I am doing the practice, uh, there's a sense that you are involved uh, you are doing it. You are the agent that makes this whole path come about. Yeah, this is kind of the idea when you think about the path in that way. And that is always a little bit dangerous because if you consider yourself as the agent that actually does the path, it is a bit different from how the Buddha talks about these things. The way the Buddha talks about the path is very often about the path being natural, as I was saying during the guided meditation. It is something that happens through cause and effect. It is not something that you actually make happen. In fact, if you make it happen, uh, then usually you get in the way uh, because you don't know how to make it happen. Uh, the ego is the opposite of the path. The ego gets in the way of the practice. Uh, and so that is always slightly dangerous. Uh, to some extent, we have no choice. Uh, to some extent, the ego will always get involved because that is just the nature of the mind. Uh, unless you are a stream mentor, and they are unfortunately far and few between these days, but if you are a stream mentor, wonderful. But if you're not, <laughs> then you're going to get the ego involved a little bit. Yeah, that's just the way it is with this, uh, with this mind of ours. Uh. But the ideal way, if you want to look at things from the way the path really should work, uh, it is the idea that actually the path goes by itself. And what you have to do is to understand the teachings. You have to have an idea of right view. You have to have an idea of the foundation for this whole thing. And as you have that in place, the path unfolds. And this is why on the Noble Eightfold Path, we have right view at the beginning. The more solid that right view is, 
the more you just do what you have to do. You want to be kind. You want to be generous. You want to go and meditate. You want to disappear into your little cave yeah, and get into deep stillnesses and all of these kind of things. yeah. And it's beautiful. I, I just observe my own teacher here, Ajahn Brahm, and see how he lives his life. And it's the most wonderful way of living his life. He says that as soon as he can possibly escape, he just disappears. His mind is always leaning towards meditation, leaning towards samadhi, leaning towards these things. And so as soon as he sees kind of a, a, a kind of a hole in the program, he just disappears and you know, suddenly he's gone. Actually, these days, suddenly he's gone. That's not really true anymore because he's too weighty to be gone very suddenly. But uh, you know what I mean. Yeah, He disappears as quickly as he can. Uh, and so the mind is leaning towards the Dhamma, you know, the line is leaning. This is the most beautiful way of practicing it. It becomes a natural process. It is driven by the idea of right view. And this is also true for the Brahma Viharas. Yeah, if you want to practice the Brahma Viharas, it is about how you look at the world. It's about your right view. It's about how you think about other people that enables these Brahma Viharas to happen in the right way. Yeah, if you want to have a metta towards the world, well, it depends on how you look at other people. If you want to have compassion, it depends on how you relate to other people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that is the foundation. So so much of understanding the practice of the Brahma Viharas, the divine, the so-called divine abidings, uh, is really about considering and thinking about things in the right way. That is such an important part of it. So let's. <clears throat> Look at some of these Brahma Viharas and see if we can uh, make some headway on how to develop these things. Uh, and so the first one of the four, yeah, the four are metta, which is like uh, friendliness or loving kindness. Then you have karuna, which is basically compassion. Uh, you have mudita, which is joy. Yeah, basically it is joy. Some people say sympathetic joy, but joy is a more direct translation. And the last one is upeka, which is like equanimity or even-mindedness or something like that. So starting with metta, how does metta come about? And uh, the way metta comes about is actually described. Yeah, it is. You can find it in the suttas if you know where to look. Uh, it is also described very concisely in that beautiful meditation manual called the Visuddhimagga. The Visuddhimagga is kind of a, a draws together many of the various lines and strands from the suttas and puts it together in a very concise form. Uh, and it says in the Visuddhimagga, and it's also echoed in the suttas. Uh, that to have metta, you have to see what is manapa in other people. And the word manapa means what is pleasing in other people. When you see the pleasing side in others, and manapa is also very closely related to the idea of the word pia. Pia means dear in Pali. So when you see those aspects that are endearing, endearing qualities or pleasing qualities in others, that is when metta happens. And that is a very useful thing to understand because then you actually know really how metta can happen. Yeah, this is so. What does this mean in practice? Well, what it means in practice is that when you sit down, the very first thing you should establish is this perception of endearing and pleasing qualities in somebody or maybe in the world at large or whatever. Yeah, that is the first thing to establish. So if you want to do the metta practice, uh, you should you think of somebody. Yeah, the, they often say the loved person or the liked person, uh, but someone who you see the good qualities in her. Uh, and when we talk about good qualities, we usually mean good spiritual qualities. Uh, yeah, so someone, I don't know who is your favorite person in the world, and maybe uh, whoever that might be. It doesn't have to be Ajahn Brahm or Venerable Chanda or anything like that. It can be anything really. Uh, Sometimes it is best not to make it personal. Sometimes if you follow the way it is talked about in the suttas, you just think maybe of a certain direction. You have all the beings in a certain direction. And then you remind yourself of the good qualities in those beings. There's lots of people in the world with very beautiful qualities. Lots of people in the world who are very generous. Lots of people in the world who are very kind, who have compassion. And you remind yourself of these qualities. What do they mean? 
What do they feel like? Yeah, personally. Yeah. And then you know the endearing aspect of these people who have these qualities. Uh, and then once you have established that perception in your mind of those qualities, uh, then you can start to say, may you be happy, may you be well. Uh, and then there is a chance that that feeling will arise as a consequence uh, of that. Uh, so that shows you what it is, uh, what it means to be able to establish metta. And then when you do the metta meditation, it is very simple. Yeah, May you be well, may you be happy. You can say it to the devas, you can say it to anyone you like. It doesn't really matter, anyone in the world. The idea is just to have this sense, positive sense of other beings in the world. So it is very simple. If you understand the basic idea of how it works, it is quite easy. But then the idea and what this is kind of where the visuddhi maga adds a little twist to this whole idea of metta it says that there is like a near enemy and a far enemy to the idea of metta practice and the near enemy is the idea of desire yeah desire for the other person or attachment maybe to the other person the pali word that is used is raga, and raga means like desire in a very general sense. Because if you see the beauty in another person, you can very might get attached to them. Yeah, wow, this person is so wonderful. I want to be with this person. Maybe I should have a relationship with them. Or I don't know what happens. Yeah, so you can see how metta can very easily sort of go down the wrong track. Yeah, yeah. Before you know it, you kind of you end up in the uh, you can end go wrong. Yeah. And Ajahn Shah, this is, I should, maybe I shouldn't say this, this is kind of a secret monk's uh, business. Uh, so if you want to hear some secret monk's business, this is, this is your opportunity. But apparently Ajahn Shah, he said that, uh, uh, be careful we're having too much metta, because before you know it, you end up having babies. Uh, that's what he, <laughs> finally what he said. <laughs> so you can see that is the near enemy of metta. Yeah, you're kind of going in the wrong direction. You're getting attached to somebody. You're getting into relationships. And that is where it goes wrong here. Yeah? And so how can we avoid that? And the way to avoid that is to make sure that when you have metta, you want it to be as pure as possible. The moment it is with attachments, the moment it is with desire, actually it isn't really metta anymore. It is something else. It is more like romantic ideas, romantic love or something. And that is not what we're trying to develop here. You're trying to develop something much more pure. And so don't do metta towards someone you are attracted to. Yeah, don't do metta towards someone, whoever that might be. Usually if you are a kind of a straight person, do metta to someone of your own gender, not the opposite gender. Yeah, at least start that way. Uh, and, if, and of course, if you are gay, then it become, goes the other way around. And so you do something to someone who you are not attracted to. That is kind of a very important part. That is where you start out. And then you spread it out to the world at large afterwards to avoid this kind of trap. There's another interesting idea that is taught in the Visuddhi Manga. You shouldn't have metta, it says, towards dead people. Because if you do it towards dead people, you can maybe become a bit sad. You can miss the person. And then also, again, you it can become difficult to have that metta. But apart from that, you can kind of visualize, you can play with these ideas of metta in whatever way you like. You can do it towards individuals. You can do it with the world at large. You can do it in whatever way works for you. The most important thing is keep it incredibly simple. Bring up those feelings of what it means that another person is pleasing and dear and endearing, and then wish that person well. That is really all you have to do. The other thing about metta there is the near enemy and then there is the far enemy. And the far enemy of metta is the problem of, uh, <coughs> of ill will. And so to overcome ill will, uh, you want to first of all, uh, you want to overcome that first of all before metta becomes possible really. So you start off by overcoming the ill will and then the metta uh, arises afterwards. If you feel really upset one day for whatever reason, okay, chillax, have a cup of tea, read a nice sutta, do something positive, go for a walk somewhere, whatever it takes, and then relax. Remind yourself that everyone in the world needs compassion and understanding and send some of that compassion and understanding into the world. Uh, 
The second aspect of the Brahma Viharas uh, is the idea of Karuna. And Karuna is, of course, the idea of compassion in the world. Uh, and the world needs a lot of compassion. There's a lot of turmoil in the world, a lot of problems in the world. Uh, so compassion means this seeing of the suffering in the world, uh, the problems that are actually there. That is what compassion really is about. Uh, and uh, sometimes it comes very naturally. Uh, yeah, if you have, if you are, uh, if you have a child, some of you are probably parents. Uh, yeah, if you are a child, uh, how do you feel for your little child, small child, when it hurts itself? Uh, yeah, you want to look after that child. Uh, you want to uh, give it a bit of support, and you feel compassion for it. Uh, you take it maybe into your arms and you pat it on the head or whatever to make it feel secure and happy. That is the idea of compassion. Uh, yeah, when someone is hurt in this particular way. Uh, and uh, so this is what we want to do, not only for our own children uh, or the people who are most dear to us, uh, but the whole world that we want to see in that way. Uh, everyone in the world is worthy of that kind of compassion. Uh, yeah? So when you see the suffering in the world, uh, you want to help relieve that suffering. Uh, and that idea of relieving suffering in the world uh, is what the idea of compassion is about. Uh. Now, you can imagine that the near enemy of compassion, uh, and uh, this is kind of obvious, I suppose, in many ways, uh, is the being overwhelmed by the dukkha or the suffering of the world. Uh, yeah, it is very easy to become overwhelmed by that. And when you become overwhelmed by that, actually, you start grieving and you become sad rather than having compassion. So you really want to avoid this problem of uh, over-focusing on the suffering. You want more to focus on the solution to the problem. Okay, may you be well and happy. Yeah, I'm going to help you to be well and happy. May you be well and happy. Yeah, may you be free of suffering. That should be the focus, the relief of suffering, rather than the uh, um, focus too much on the suffering itself. And to be able to do that, I will give you a couple of examples of kind of how you can do this as a very a practical matter. And uh, if you think, for example, about the wars in the world, uh, sometimes you may see some of those scenes of the wars, people dying, you see all the suffering, people grieving over the disease. And when you see that, uh, you have to be very careful because it's very, very easy to become overwhelmed. Uh, and so what you need to do in that kind of situation uh, is to remember that, yes, uh, there is that suffering in all of those people right now. But that suffering does not determine them as human beings. What determines us as human beings in the long run for the future is the qualities we have as human beings. If people are good people, they have a good future. The war in Gaza, the war in Ukraine does not determine our future. Our future is determined by much deeper qualities inside of us. So know that that suffering is only temporary. Maybe if that person dies, if they have been living in a good way, they get reborn straight in heaven. Yeah, so maybe they say, thank you. Thank you for killing me. Actually, this is much better. Yeah, I <laughs> so thank you for the support and getting me kind of over into the heaven realm as quickly as possible. Maybe that is the right view. The Buddhist idea of the world is quite different from the ordinary ideas of the world. And sometimes when we take this into account, we look at the suffering in the world in a different way. Very often it is just temporary. And when that temporary problem is over, then actually life carries on in a very different way. And by thinking about it like that, you can see your job is just to help support people when they are suffering temporarily. And then they will go on afterwards according to their own uh, whatever karma they have made or however they have been living their lives or whatever good qualities they may have. Uh, so try to change your perceptions in this way. Seeing the world in the right way is so fundamental to being able to do anything on the Buddhist path. Uh, everything kind of emerges out of this way of looking at the world. Uh, and then you will not be overwhelmed by this thing we call suffering. You will be able to have compassion, which is supportive instead. Uh, the far enemy of compassion is the idea called the Vihingsa in the suttas. And Vihingsa is like uh, the idea of uh, uh, being harmful to beings in the world, uh, 
not caring what your consequences of your actions are, not really, you know, not really uh, just being, sometimes it can even mean cruelty. Cruelty is obviously an aspect of Vihingsa. And so you have this is the uh, the problem, yeah? So you, first of all, you have to kind of let go of that coldness within. Uh, and then when you let go of that coldness within by empathizing a little bit with the people around you, then the compassion becomes possible. Uh, may you be well, may you be happy. Uh, you can do it towards animals, this kind of reflection of, of compassion, uh, because animals are often have a lot of suffering in life. Uh, yeah, animal life can be very hard, uh, yeah, may you be well. May you be free of suffering. Yeah? May you get reborn again soon as a human being. Yeah? So you can carry on the good practices that maybe you did before. Yeah? And then you can have compassion in the right way. Yeah? Then the third Brahma Vihara is a, a very interesting one. And I think maybe one that is often not quite understood in the right way. Yeah? And it's called Mudita in the suttas. Yeah? And Mudita... Uh, means really just the idea of joy or gladness of the mind. Uh, sometimes it is translated as sympathetic joy, as if it is directed to the world around us. Uh, but it is not obviously the case that that actually is what is happening with, the, with this particular Brahma Vihara. Uh, the idea of joy here, the way it is described uh, here in the uh, Visuddhimagga, is that you see success uh, and when you see success for people, for anyone, then the sympathetic joy arises. Yeah, so seeing success is the most important thing. Yeah? So who should you see success for? Well, it is just like it is with compassion and as it is also for metta, that success can also be your own success. It doesn't have to be about other people. It can be the success in your own life. And so when you rejoice in the successes in your own life, especially those successes that have to do with the spiritual path, then you have a degree of joy inside of you. And this is, in fact, exactly what you find, I think, in the suttas. When the suttas talk about the idea of contemplating your own virtue, yeah, the, what is called sila nusati in the suttas, the recollection of your own virtue, that is actually contemplating your own success, because that is the success you have in virtue. You remind yourself that you are living on the five precepts or whatever it is that you are living on. You remind yourself that you are trying to be kind, and what a wonderful thing that is in the world. Or you do the chaga nusati, the recollection of your generosity, that is also a recollection of your success. Yeah, wow, well, I'm succeeding to live with a heart which is not stained by stinginess. I'm willing to give, I want to give, I enjoy giving in the world. And that is a sign of success on the Buddhist path. And in this way, you're bringing up your own success. Or it is the devata nusati, the contemplation of the devatas. Because these heavenly beings in the world, well, they have become heavenly beings precisely through the practice that you are pursuing by being kind, by being generous, by being learned, by having faith and confidence in these teachings. Now you are doing the same. Again, you are recalling your success. Sampati is the Pali word here. And by recalling that success, you are also uh, actually having joy right here and now relating to yourself. And I think this is an important part of the idea of mudita, which actually is not often talked about. And then you can see how it kind of begins to fit into this whole system we call the path. Yeah, because then that leads on to meditation and all of these kind of things. And if it is a Brahma Vihara, it is a very lofty kind of mudita. It is the success now that you are rejoicing in uh, is the success of samadhi, the success in mindfulness, the success in the Brahma Viharas in their own right. Uh, and then you can expand that, and you can expand that also to involve the enjoyment, the joy in finding the sympathetic joy, yeah, having the joy in other people's success. Uh, yeah, so your own success, because when you understand the happiness that you derive from success on the path, you rejoice in other people having the same. And that is such a beautiful thing to rejoice in other people's success. Too often people are envious. 
Too often people, people are jealous. Uh, too often people are discontent. Uh, and that is the wrong way of thinking about other people. Uh, it's the wrong way of dealing with it. Far better to rejoice when other people are successful. Uh, how can we do that? Uh, how can you think about life in such a way that you rejoice in someone's success rather than feeling envious? Uh, and one way of doing that, the one way that I always remind myself, uh, when I hear of one of my fellow monks having some success in meditation, uh, when I hear Ajahn Brahm, we had a beautiful talk from Ajahn Brahm here last Wednesday. He was talking about all the bliss and all the kind of happiness that he was experiencing, even while he was giving the talk. It was kind of a remarkable talk. And uh, the way to think about it is that, well, if other people have this success, what a great thing that is, because if they can do it, I can do it. This is a sign that these things are available. It is a sign that these things are available for every one of us. And the more of us can do it, the more chances are that I can also do it. So it is the signpost that these things are available in the world to every one of us. So when someone else is succeeding, yay, what a wonderful thing. Next, it's my turn to do exactly the same. And that is the right way of thinking about it. Uh, then there is no jealousy. It is a mutual rejoicing in the good spiritual qualities. Uh, and then we can all kind of move forward on that basis. Uh, so what is the near enemy of mudita? And the near enemy of mudita, of this thing we call joy or sympathetic joy, uh, uh, is um, the idea of thinking of success in worldly terms. Yeah, someone is successful in finishing their exam or someone is successful at work or someone is getting a raise or someone is getting a promotion or someone is finding a new sweetheart in their life or whatever it might be. And these things are important for most people and I understand that. But we want here to move one step higher. We want to kind of clear a bar which is kind of laid fairly high up. And so we want to kind of Focus on the spiritual rather than the worldly. So rejoice in spiritual successes. Rejoice in worldly successes also, if you like. But that is not what this really is about. That kind of lowers your mind a little bit. You want to lift it up to a higher level. This is what this really concerns. And the far enemy of mudita is called arati. And arati means like displeasure or discontent or boredom or disinterest. Yeah, It's kind of the opposite. When you have mudita, you are interested. You rejoice in things. And kind of the boredom, the listless mind that is kind of uninterested in anything at all. That is kind of what this kind of is the opposite of mudita. So uh, this is also what obviously you want to avoid as you start out. Uh, so this is uh, mudita. And I think... Uh, you know, I when I see someone like Ajahn Brahm again, Ajahn Brahm is I always talk about Ajahn Brahm because he is to me has always been my teacher. So kind of for that reason, I obviously have learned so much from him. And uh, you know, one of the things that makes Ajahn Brahm the most happy in the whole world is when one of his disciples, uh, one of his students, has some kind of success in meditation. That is what he lives for. That is what he teaches for, for everyone to have success in meditation. So if you want to make Ajahn Brahm happy, tell him that you have some success in a meditation practice. Yeah, And he will kind of give you a high five or whatever it is, that they, or fist bump or whatever it is. <laughs> when, when he hears that, and it will make him very happy because that is the purpose of Ajahn Brahm's life. Yeah, and he he one of the things about Ajahn Brahm, he wants to get rid of disciples. Uh, yeah, he wants to kind of see them disappear because when they disappear, he knows that uh, well they are having success. Yeah, they kind of now they can stand on their own two legs and they're doing very well. Uh, and that means that I actually that's a terrible thing because uh, just occurs to me based on that I am a bad failure. Uh, I've been living at Bodhidharma Monastery for thirty years and I'm still here. That's a bad sign, isn't it? If you want to get rid of his disciples, he's not succeeding with me. So I'm going to have to ask Ajahn Brahm about this. So okay, anyway, so this is what happens when they give a Dhamma talk. You get reminded about your own problems, yeah? let alone teaching other people. So, okay, anyway, so thank you for listening. So this, I kind of got the, 
this sorted out. So I'll see what happens. I'll tell you later on what the outcome was of this and, uh, you know, seeing what Ajahn Ram says about this. And whether I'm a failure or not, I will let you know later on. Huh? Anyway, let's just come quickly to the very last of the four Brahma Viharas as, as well before we come to the end. And that is the uh, Brahma Vihara of Upeka. And the idea of Upeka is the idea of equanimity, the idea of just observing the world without getting involved. All of these other Brahma Viharas, the Metta, the Compassion, the Mudita, there is a sense of involvement with things because you're focusing on people, you're focusing on the good qualities. And as long as you are involved, you cannot stand back 100% and just observe and allow things to be here. Yeah, this closeness to involvement in the world. So that's why the highest, and this is kind of surprising, the highest of all the Brahma Viharas is not metta or compassion, which may sound very high. The highest of all is actually upeka, where you stand back completely and you just observe the world for what it actually is. And when you observe the world with that kind of neutral mind, that is when it is possible to gain real insight, because insight must come from a neutral, balanced, unbiased mind. It's the only mind that is capable of insight. And so how can we do this? And what they recommend in the Vasudhi Manga to have Upeka is the idea of knowing that people are the uh, heirs of the Kama. Yeah, people will go in the future according to the Kama. Good and bad karma. Because when you know that, you realize that in the end, there's nothing much you can do. In the end, all you can do is observe people doing good, doing bad, and then their future will then depend on how they live their life. And so you stand back, not looking at the good qualities, not looking at the suffering, just understanding this inexorable law of karma, which drives people and beings forward through this kind of samsaric existence. And as you do that, you feel upeka. You may even feel a sense of dispassion and aversion because it is not very nice, really, at the end of the day. And so you pull back and then you observe. And then you may actually, that is where things really start to happen. So what are the near enemies and far enemies of upeka? And the near enemy is like basically an ordinary kind of um, equanimity that you may have in daily life where you are not really interested in anything, you're kind of bored or whatever. That is one kind of upeka. And that upeka can be good. Yeah, the ordinary upeka in daily life where you kind of keep your mind in balance. You don't allow the mind to go too much into ill will or into uh, desire is also useful, but uh, it is a lower kind of upeka and it can often go into the wrong kind of thing. Is the um, you know, boredom and lack of interest or whatever. And the far enemy of Upeka is basically desire and ill will, where the mind loses that equanimity which is it is supposed to have. That is kind of the uh, far or the bad enemy, if you like, of Upeka. So that is a brief uh, summary for you of the idea of the four Brahma Viharas. Uh, and uh, again, as with so many things on the Buddhist path, uh, it is about understanding what they mean is often the most important thing. Uh, because if you start to understand what they mean, uh, then you can incline the mind to in that direction. It becomes kind of your right view. Uh, you're looking at the world through a certain lens. And that lens is called the lens of the Dhamma, the lens of the Buddha, seeing and understanding the world in the right way. Uh, it's too, too often we see the world through the lens of defilements, through the lens of the self, and that is always distorting. The more we can see the world through the lens of the Dhamma, angled in that way, the more all of these things just happen as a matter of course, as natural expressions of your understanding and the way you think about the world. So reflect on these things. Yeah, Try to understand what they mean. And as you reflect on these things, they gradually become your view. And when they become your view, that is when they become powerful. Okay, okay. so I have uh, uh, talked for about uh, a half an hour. So uh, I think that's enough. 
So shall I, I, if there are any questions or comments, anyone would like to say anything, this is the time to do so. So, Gunter, are you in charge of questions or how does it work? Yeah. I'm in charge, yeah. I will yeah. unmute. Yeah. Thank you for another amazing talk, Sadhu. Do I have free will to make decisions in the present? Or am I conditioned and everything I do or think I am in control is driven by cause and effect of desire? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think the idea of free will is, uh, is a kind of a red herring in Buddhism. It doesn't really make any sense in the Buddhist context. I think the idea of free will is something that you find in Christianity because God is supposed to endow people with free will so they can choose stupid things. I don't know why God gave us free will so we can choose stupid things. But anyway, that seems to be the, the idea in Christianity. It's a bit strange. I, I can never get my head around Christianity. I find it, uh, I find it kind of... Uh, I don't, I, don't, I don't understand Christianity. Let me put it that way. But in Buddhism, it doesn't make any sense because... Uh, in Buddhism, the whole idea is that the world is conditioned. Uh, if, you are, if you're going to have free will, you need something that stands outside of the conditions of the world, uh, yeah? some, like a self or a god or something solid, some kind of entity which is solid on its own right. Uh, that's the only way the idea of free will makes any sense. Uh, yeah? So there cannot really be any free will. Uh, of course, if you go to, you know, like in our monastery every day, we have a beautiful meal. There's so much beautiful food. All these wonderful people bring food to the monks. It's one of the most amazing things that happens when you're a Buddhist monk. Yeah, people really look after you. It's a very, very beautiful thing. Yeah? And so you go around the table and then you think, oh, I have free will. I can choose whether I want to eat uh, uh, fish and chips or I'm going to eat uh, lasagna or or whatever it is, yeah, it's all there for the taking, yeah, the Sri Lankan food, Thai food, Chinese food, Western food, you name it, it's all kind of there. Yeah. But that is not really free will, let's just follow your desires. Uh. Yeah, the desires are already there, so you follow your desires. Uh. Or maybe you think, I'm not going to follow my desires, yeah, that is free will, yeah, because I'm not following my desires. No, the reason you're not following your desires is because maybe you think that's the Dhamma, the teaching of the Buddha. That's just another condition overriding the other condition. So when you start to look at it like that, you start to understand that everything in life is this network, yeah, this kind of uh, uh, an, a nexus of various kinds of cause and conditions coming together. And then those cause and conditions coming together make you act in a certain way. But to me, the most important point is not so much whether there is free will or not. But I think we can put that question aside. What matters is that it feels like we have free will. Yeah? And you cannot stop yourself from acting on that impulse, on that sense that you are free. We have to act on that sense. And because you cannot stop yourself from acting on that impulse that you have free will, make sure that if you do act on that, make good choices yeah use that impulse to make good choices in your life because if you don't well then you are letting yourself down and so the reality is that we have to act as if we have free will until you become a stream enter the moment you become a stream enter you are immersed in the dhamma the dhamma becomes your will the dhamma takes the place of your will yeah, the stream mentor is someone who is being in the stream means that the Dhamma is now in charge. And you can allow the Dhamma to unfold within you. And as you allow the Dhamma to unfold within you, Noble Eightfold Path happens as a consequence. That is the beautiful thing about being a stream mentor. Before you are a stream mentor, there will be some aspect of you that is Dhamma. There is some aspect of you which is defilement. There is some aspect of you which is the sense of self. And all of these things will kind of intermingle to make you act in certain ways. Yeah? So your job is to go as much as you possibly can onto the Dhamma. Leave the defilements to one side. Leave the sense of self to one side. Allow the Dhamma to steer your life. That is the ideal. It is impossible to do it 100% in practice. Very often, even when you think you are following the Dhamma, actually you're following the sense of self. Yeah, I'm going to follow the Dhamma. Okay, now let me get started. That's the sense of self right there. <laughs> yeah. 
And so it is very hard to let the Dhamma kind of just roll on. Uh, so don't worry too much about it. Uh, but uh, uh, again, you do your best to the best of your ability. And as long as you're doing that, you're going to go in the right direction. Uh. Okay, Ginter, Mr. Ginter, please fire away. Uh. There is one more question. How would a stream winner use right view to train their perception? Please could you answer this in the context of when one is overwhelmed by injustice and discrimination in the workplace over a long period of time? Okay. So um, the stream entry doesn't really have to use right view or, or use perception. For the stream entry, it is kind of it is natural. Uh, uh, so the question is, I guess, suppose, how would a stream mentor, I suppose, deal with that situation? Maybe that's kind of the question. How does a stream mentor deal with a situation when you are discriminated against and you are treated badly? Uh, and I would say that the stream enter would, uh, 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 would bring it up. Yeah, they would say, okay, go to the, whatever person might be able to listen, uh, your boss or someone in the, up in the hierarchy, maybe talk to the people directly who are causing you trouble, see if they can be talked out of it, yeah? And try to resolve it in that way. A stream mentor is a very courageous person. A stream mentor is not someone who is afraid of what other people will say or whatever they will do. They will just do what is appropriate, looking after themselves. Yeah, so this is kind of one thing about the stream mentor. The next thing the stream mentor would do, the stream mentor will not be attached to the job. Yeah, the stream mentor will say, okay, if this is the job, I can't resolve it. Uh, they would probably leave and they probably would sleep under a bridge if they had to, rather than kind of stay in that kind of job. Yeah, so if they had, if they needed the money, because, and then they would rather kind of just do something, kind of, you know, go sleeping on the bench in the park or whatever, because uh, why not? Yeah. It's a freedom in sleeping on the bench in the park, yeah. And so sometimes I think uh, taking a stream mentor as our guide or as our role model can sometimes be too high, too ambitious, uh, because these are people who can renounce very easily and who can kind of give up very easily. Very often we are a little bit trapped in the situations that we find ourselves in. Maybe you have a financial obligation that you have to meet, so you have to keep the job. Or maybe you are, you know, or, or whatever. It could be all kinds of things. But um, uh, if you can, and if you find that you have tried and you find it very difficult to be in that kind of job, leave the job. Yeah, your life is too important. Your life is too important to stay in that kind of job. And if you haven't got any money, come to the monastery. Stay in the monastery. Yeah, fly off to Perth. We will kind of... Uh, put you up for a you know, few weeks or a few months if you have to. In the meantime, you can apply for new jobs, yeah? And then you can go back again afterwards and then you can kind of carry on. Uh, think a bit outside the box, yeah? Try to see a broader picture. Don't allow your life to be diminished and to be damaged by kind of your environment. Sometimes we have to look after ourselves uh, and that is perfectly, perfectly okay, uh, especially if you cannot see any solution to the problem around you. Uh. I have another thing, which I think more is a comment. I have found giving myself to the daily practice of giving myself for others as much as possible when I need to work or offer my food, for example and found this is a helpful practice and it produces a sense of well-being and reflection. Hmm. Yeah, yes, I think that's a very good point because this is just a uh, kind of a aspect of the idea of generosity. Yeah, if you give yourself to others uh, in a certain way, you are being generous. Uh, you're allowing your life, you're giving your life a broader meaning, uh, giving yourself to the world. Uh, and in a sense... You know, that is what 
the stream mentor, coming back to the idea of a stream mentor again, because the stream mentor is like, in a sense, the ideal in Buddhism. Once we understand the ideal, we can understand what we should be striving towards. Uh, and a stream mentor is someone who gives themselves completely. Uh, yeah, their life is about service. Uh, their life is about supporting uh, others. Uh, and they gain enormous amounts of joy and happiness. It feeds straight back into their own practice. Uh, so if we can live lives of service, uh, it is very, very powerful. Uh, one of the things you can do, which can be very useful, is when you meditate, uh, remind yourself that meditation is not a self selfish thing. Uh, yeah, When you meditate, it's not just for yourself. Give your meditation to other people. Uh, and that is not just some kind of fantasy, it is actually a reality, because when you give your meditation to others, you know that your meditation is... Uh, uh, going to be a benefit to others because when you meditate, you are more peaceful, you are more calm, you have more time for others, you have more compassion, you have more understanding. So because of that, it is not just an idle wish, the idea of giving your meditation to others, it is real. And so if you think of that in the beginning, this is my gift to the world, also to myself. It is one way of practicing this thing that you are saying here yeah, about uh, uh, how did you put it again? Or giving yourself to others, yeah? Similar kind of idea. Yeah. So absolutely, yeah. Don't have any other new in the chat, neither my one. So once again, what makes or drives the ego? How can I lessen the ego? <laughs> what makes and drives the ego? Well, the ego is uh, the ego is very sneaky. Yeah? The ego is the thing that wants to become important in the world, that wants to feel good about itself, it wants to do all of these kind of things. It's the self inside, it's the I. Yeah? I want to be this, I want to be that. And the ego is driven by status, it is driven by uh, being praised and not being blamed, it's driven by being admired and liked and all of these kind of things. That's what the ego is. And so to avoid that and to avoid the ego becoming too strong, you have to remember the unreliability of all of these things in the world. Yeah, the world is very uncertain. And if you rely, you know, one of the things about praise and blame that I always remind myself, most of the people who praise me and blame me, they have no idea what they're talking about anyway. They praise me for stupid things, they blame me for stupid things. Who cares what they think, right? Someone praises you at work, say, oh, yeah, you're doing a really good job. And actually what they're doing, they're manipulating you to work harder. That's really the truth of it sometimes. They may not even be aware of that themselves, but that is often the effect of being praised. Yeah, you want to kind of prove that you are living up to the standard or whatever. But so what if you're doing well at work? Would the Buddha praise you for doing well at work? The Buddha would say, for, leave work and become a monk or a nun. That's what the Buddha might say. Yeah, this is you're wasting your time kind of doing, spending so much time in an office or whatever. And so what is really worthy of praise in the world is usually not praised. What is really worthy of blame is not blamed anyway. Yeah, if you are kind-hearted, that is what worthy of praise. But how many people praise you for being kind-hearted? Maybe very occasionally, but not so often. The praise we get is often for shallow things, stupid things, insignificant things. And once you start to understand that, and once you understand that you cannot control it anyway, blame and praise just comes randomly in life. Okay, you forget about it. You let it go. You don't care about it anymore. The same thing with status. You know, you have a certain status in life. Uh, does it make any sense to buy into that status, uh, to feel proud of your achievements? Maybe you have a certain education or you have a certain place in the workplace or you have whatever it is that kind of gives you status. Uh, is that important? Uh, it is very unreliable. It is very uncertain. You have it one day, the next day it's gone. You have it one life, the next life it's gone. Uh, that is not reliable. And if you buy into those things, into that kind of status, it means that you are very often, you tie yourself up to something that is unreliable. You're going to end up becoming very disappointed as a consequence of that. So try to see through these things, these empty things in life, which are not really important. And you will notice that whenever your ego grasps onto these things, you become very vulnerable. 
Yeah, very vulnerable to the downside, very vulnerable to these things actually falling apart. And that vulnerability, the ego is a very vulnerable thing. And that is a very big part of the problem. But the most important way of overcoming the ego is simply to practice the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah. Um, if you are consistently kind, if you are consistently compassionate, if you are consistently understanding, there can be no room for the ego, because the ego will sometimes not want to be kind. Yeah, if the ego is challenged and you feel bad about something or whatever it might be, then the ego will not want to be kind. So if you then try to turn it around, you don't allow the ego the upper hand, you are undermining the ego merely by being kind, merely by being generous, merely by not allowing the ego to kind of rear its ugly face, as they say here. And then you're already kind of on the right track. And that to me is the most important thing, simply practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. Be kind, be compassionate, be caring in the world, and then actually all of these negative things are undermined as a consequence. Thank you, Achan Pram, for your valuable advice. Achan. Ramali. Ramali. Yeah. <laughs> that was the last comment. Um, Excellent. Yeah, and uh, possibly surely you can talk. So thank you, Ajahn Pramali, for that opportunity to practice meditation together and for your always very gentle guidance with lots of silences in between. I love your guided meditations. And also for the wonderful Dhamma talk and the response to the questions. So much appreciation for your generosity in giving your time, not only to share the Dhamma with us, but also to support Anukampa, um, Anukampa Bhikkhuni project. Um, and we so appreciate that. And so... It's just so wonderful that we have this opportunity when people give the Dhamma and give this wisdom and give this kindness and it's freely given. And um, the response to, to gratitude is, is to be generous back in return if we can. So um, the uh, Anukampa Bhikkhuni project completely relies on the generosity of its supporters. And now, um, Venerable Chanda and Venerable Upeka, they, the nuns have a wonderful new uh, vihara that just came about for the generosity of others. But it's a big place and it needs support. And at the moment, financial support is the most useful because the, the, the bhikkhunis are on retreat. So maybe a standing order and or a, a direct debit or a one off payment, um, I think. Gunter's going to put something in the chat if he hasn't done, but it's on the website. So whatever you can. And uh, as Ajahn Brahmani, Brahmani has reminded us, generosity can bring us great joy. And it's the first step on the path. So we just give what we can and what we're inclined to do. So I'd like to encourage that. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Shirley. And thank you, everyone. Nice to see you all again. I wish you all the very best. And uh, take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>